Good morning, and welcome to Generation Curious. What's that, I hear you thinking? Well, as well you might, it's you. You're curious. You with your mobile phones and always on internet connections. You with instantaneous access to more information than every physical library in the world can cumulatively hold. And you with your ability to search whimsically on any question that occurs to you at the moment that it occurs to you, and potentially to cheat very naughtily on pub quizzes. But access to all of this information rests on one key behavior, that of search. And search is inherently limited. Search assumes that we can articulate exactly what it is that we want to know the answer to, and that we can find the words. Ask my 18-year-old son, William. You can't always find the words. It's very frustrating when you've only got pointing and two words, gone and car. But even as adults, we think, we feel, we wonder about so many things that we can't necessarily articulate. What's that beautiful, unusual flower that we've never seen before? Who painted that work of art if there isn't a label next to it that tells you? What did those ruins look like when they were first built? What does that danger warning sign say in a foreign language if you don't speak that language? Or more critically, what does any written word or text say if you're illiterate, like large swathes of the population? Here's the answer: the mobile phone, the ubiquitous daily companion in our lives, but also increasingly now our magic wand and remote control on the world around us. Some years ago, the phone moved from here. To here, texting. In recent times, it's actually moved here, and it's started to become an extension of our physical senses. Take, for example, audio recognition. We can now hold our phone up and listen, and it operates like our ears. It can hear bird song and tell you what that bird is, or a track on the radio and tell you who, who, who the artist is, and you can buy it instantly. We've also seen touch come into play now with near-field communication, the ability to pay for things by simply swiping your device at it. Proximity with eye beacons, so that you can receive relevant, targeted information based on where you are at any moment in time. But the most powerful of all of our senses is sight. We are such visual people. It's said that up to 85% of our learning and cognition and perception is driven by sight. Listen to a piece of information, and three days later, you'll remember up to 10% of it. Add an image, and you'll remember up to 65% of it. Sight trumps all other senses out there. Now, of course, the eye of the phone is nothing new. We're obsessed with our cameras. We live life behind a lens, frequently Instagramming and filtering it so it looks so much better. And of course, we communicate in images. Take emojis and the, the trend there, and of course, the exponential rise of platforms such as Instagram and Pinterest and Facebook. And image recognition technology is nothing new. I'm sure you're all familiar with the very ugly black and white, pixelated, and sexily named QR code that appeared some years ago. Well, over recent years, we've seen an evolutionary path of a number of different stepping stone technologies along a theme. We've seen Microsoft M tags, Snap tags, which is a circular QR code within which you can put an image or a brand, digital watermarking, and the list goes on and on and on. We've now reached the end point of that progression with a technology that is known as markerless image recognition. This is exactly as the name would suggest. It is nothing needs to be done to an image or object in order to turn it into a trigger for digital content. The image and object is the trigger. Now this is huge. This is utterly game-changing. What it means is that the 99.999% of the world that is static, is physical, doesn't move, isn't connected. Can now effectively be digitized simply by looking at it, and it's this that we think of as this new trend of visual search or visual browsing. Let's have a look at it in practice. Fingers crossed. My naughty William. So we're going to open up the eye of the device, 
And if you can see, it's looking around for something it recognizes. The first few demos I'll show you are very, very simple look and search results. So first of all, we have a book, Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. You could, of course, read the back, or you could type those words into Google, find out more about the track, uh, about the book. Or you could simply look at it. And instantly, you have access to a light web version of search results that tell you more about the book. For example, short form information about the, the author, also quotes, a summary of the book. You've got related texts by the author. You've also got here, you can see a cap there, study notes, and a number of aggregated sources there where you can go and find out more should you be studying this at school. So very, very instant, easily accessible content based on just looking at the book. Another example, Iron Man 3, the DVD. Again, instantaneously, you can go in, find out more about the cast, look at the cast list, potentially watch the trailer, reviews, price comparison, and of course, all the social networks awards, and much, much more. But displayed in a very accessible, simple way that assumes you're on a mobile device and on the go. How about a work of art, the example we've already uh, discussed? Van Gogh's Starry Night. Again, look and unlock. And this simple form content that tells you more about the artist, where you can visit it, you can see a link to MoMA there, and indeed the, the mapping functionality would actually show you where MoMA is. Opportunities to buy potentially replicas of the art, a tea towel, uh, and of course detail on the art itself. And all of these light web content deep links further into the internet as required, so it becomes a multi-navigational system for you. And now for something totally different. Now, Imagine this little guy was on stage with me rather than a picture of him. Sweet. But what is he? So it turns out he is a pug. You may have known that. Um, but here again, we've got these light web search results about nearest vets, trivia. I'm not quite sure where the buy now is going to go. But like, we'll try trivia. If we tap on trivia, see where that takes us. 29 facts about dogs you didn't know. Oh. <laughs> I, for one, did not know that. So, that's simple search based on image recognition, but what you can also do is work with the owners of the physical world and actually curate beautiful content experiences on the physical world around us. And I'll show you a couple of examples of this. Take, for instance, education. This is an educational textbook for maths, where students are encouraged to actually look at the page and bring it to life. So a very proactive learning experience they can actually see come to life in front of them. And this is harnessing augmented reality technology. And they can scroll through and have a look at the shape from lots of different angles and see it come to life. So very, very exciting technologies when it can be employed in this way. Or something super simple, a magazine, flat, passive, old the minute it came off the, uh, the, the printer. But we can now look at it and in real time vote about whether we agree or disagree about whether another Star Wars film is a good idea and see what other readers are thinking at exactly that same time. The opportunities for advertising and marketing, as you'd appreciate, are immense. We've worked on a campaign with the Natural History Museum in LA where they did a poster campaign around town. Gorgeous. 3D AR, but also functional linking that tells you how to book tickets and where the museum is. And here, something to tap into the social audience. And we'll try and get a picture of our TED audience with a T-Rex here. Smile. And share with the world. 
I will save that for later and I'll put it across the hashtag. So just two more quick examples. Product packaging. Every single product now can become interactive simply by looking at it. This is a lovely example of an ingredient that can be brought to life with recipe information, how-to videos, coupons that you could potentially download. Again, a beautiful AR experience, but you don't rely on it because you can actually pull the phone away and keep that content on your device, albeit a bit skewer. And the last one I want to show you, many of you, I'm sure, will have one of these in your pockets and wallets right now, the Oyster card. And you get a real-time tube update. So it plugs into the API of uh, Transport for London. You'd be forgiven for thinking that's not live, given that there's a good service on all lines, but you, you get the impression. Back to our slides. So hopefully you have a sense of some of the industries that we see this disrupting, but it can apply to literally every industry out there. We as a business are very, very excited about education, arts and culture. Not just textbooks that you can do math puzzles with, but what about chemical structures coming to life? Native French speakers speaking as you look at the page, or being able to peel away layers of anatomy. Arts and culture as a historian is something that I'm hugely excited about. What about hieroglyphics that can translate themselves? or works of art that can rewind the process of their creation so you can actually go back and see how the artist uh, created it. Hugely exciting. And print. Is print media dying? Absolutely not. It is changing, but people love to feel pages and have books and magazines in their hands. And not only can last night's news be brought instantly up to date by looking at it, you can join votes and polls, but you can also potentially Harry Potter the back page into life. So the picture of the guy celebrating the goal, you can actually play the goal from last night, and so much more. The industry that I'm particularly excited about, and the one that terrifies my husband, is for the implications in retail. You can now whimsically and spontaneously buy anything, whether it's a picture of something that you see on a billboard in the pages of a magazine, or perhaps through the window of a closed shop that you can't go into. Look at it, purchase it. The lady's handbag on the train next to you. With this technology, you can literally buy the shirt off someone's back. And the applications across things like property, being able to look at any house and see what its purchase history was. Pharmaceuticals and drug packaging, where you can find out more about dosage or indeed you know, find out about complicated inhalers and understand how to slot them together. And the list goes on and on. But how will we do this? To many minds, it seems a little far-fetched, and the task ahead of us is enormous. Of course, we have to index billions and billions of images and objects for image recognition. We then need to associate digital content with it, Content that's relative, relevant and informative, but is also displayed in a way that's sensitive to a user on the go on a mobile screen. We need to assess what information will be most relevant to them at that moment, which means it needs to be contextual. It needs to know who you are, where you are, and when you're looking. So that if you're looking at one object in France, that response is returned to you in French, as opposed to in Germany or anywhere else in the world. And of course, it needs to be harnessed in sensible business models. Who knows what those will be? Certainly, I have a view. I feel that fewer strong search engines will be better than a plethora of own app vertical technologies appearing left, right, and center. But only time will tell. Here's my naughty William again. Now, he's here because when he was born, he had eyes and a brain. But it's only really now that his visual acuity is starting to kick in, and he's really beginning to understand and appreciate the images and objects that he sees around him. The current state of visual search and discovery is just like William. We have amazing hardware, brilliant cameras and processor chips and cloud computing available. And all this technology is starting to converge now with image recognition, computer vision, with artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and server, cloud-based um, storage. But we need to start learning. We need to start putting it out there, testing, assessing the consumer appetite for what's happening. 
and then feeding that in and hopefully using users around the world to start populating digital content on the physical world around them, so democratizing the process and speeding it up. And this isn't going to happen overnight. Now, you might all be familiar with the term the Internet of Things, a very trendy term that involves putting a computer chip and hardware into connected devices. With visual search, we can build the Internet of everything, and the potential is just massive. I believe that this will fundamentally change how we go about our daily lives, that multiple times per day we will sate our spontaneous curiosity about something that we look at simply by looking and unlocking. And with each look, we'll enhance and deepen our understanding and appreciation of this wonderful physical world around us. Thank you very much.